Okay, welcome everybody to another SETI Live. I'm Seth Shostak, an astronomer at the SETI Institute. And today we have a very special guest. You know, that sounds kind of trite, but it really is a special guest. It's Andrea, <laughs> Andrea Gez, who's a professor in the Astronomy and Physics Department down at UCLA in the Southern California. Andrea, thanks very much for being with us. My pleasure, Seth. <laughs> okay. Well, you just won the Nobel Prize in Physics. So we're going to, you know, look a little bit about why they gave you the prize, what the in impact of that discovery is. But first, I mean, just imagine that you're sitting in a restaurant there, you know, Hamburger Hamlet or something in West Los Angeles, if they still have those. And somebody next to you recognizes you as the winner of the Nobel Prize. And they ask, well, what would you get the prize for? What would you tell them in the short order? For proving the existence of supermassive black holes. All right, supermassive black holes. I mean, you know, what, what is an ordinary black hole? What's the weight of an ordinary black hole? Well, ordinary black holes um, were predicted first and are roughly 10 times the mass of the sun and are thought to be the end products of massive stars evolution. Okay, so uh, when a massive star dies, it ends up as a black hole. It does have a choice about this, right? No choice. <laughs> no free will. <laughs> uh, yeah, and the interesting thing about this, in contrast to the supermassive black holes, is they were predicted theoretically first and then found observationally afterwards. Whereas the supermassive, and what I mean by supermassive is a million to a billion times the mass of the sun were discovered um, or hinted at observationally before we had the theoretical framework for understanding them. So it's been 50 years since people started to think about the possibility of supermassive black holes. And the work that we've done is really to solidify the evidence for these things. Okay, so, so it's no longer so much a hypothesis that there could be one of these beasts in the center of the Milky Way, but uh, you've actually demonstrated in a straightforward way that nobody can argue with. Well, we think so. <laughs> well, obviously there's some people in Scandinavia who agreed with you. Okay, now you mentioned the fact that giant black holes, a little different from the black holes that are made when a star, maybe 10 times the mass of the sun, you know, expires, these, these massive ones uh, are often in the centers of galaxies, right? I've heard people say, well, almost every galaxy has a supermassive black hole in the center of a, in, in the center there. But why were these even considered? I mean, what reason did people have to think that the mother of all black holes might be in the centers of galaxies? So there are some galaxies that um, exhibit unusually energetic uh, centers. So we call them active galactic nuclei because their nuclei or centers have this tremendous activity uh, merging from them. And um, these are about 10% of all galaxies. And um, that energetic phenomena in the form of jets or emission at the center that is unlike anything emitted by stars or gas is what led people to think that these are really massive black holes that are accreting material from their surrounding. Um, but the notion that all supermassive black holes came from the idea that maybe every galaxy starts, uh, is formed with a supermassive black hole at its center and that in ordinary galaxies, they're just quiet. Uh, there's just nothing around them to accrete from. So you call them stealth black holes. Stealth black holes. But, but the fact that they're, you know, millions, even occasionally billions of times, you know, more massive than your run of the mill black hole, uh, you know, that begs the question, I mean, how do you make something like that? I mean, there are no stars that are millions of times the mass of the sun after all. Well, that's a, that's a really interesting question. And in fact, there's been a, a tremendous evolution in the thinking there. So when we first, this, the work that um, we've done to show that there's a supermassive black hole has actually gone in multiple stages. And in the early stages, um, people used to ask which came first, the galaxy or the black hole, sort of like the chicken or the egg uh, framework. And we had explanations or the community had explanations for both the idea that maybe the galaxy formed first and the density at the center was so high that it could form a black hole 
or conversely, that a supermassive black hole was seeded in the early universe and provided the seed for the future galaxy. But what we understand today is that actually that's the right, the, sorry, the wrong form framework for the question because it looks like the mass of supermassive black holes is correlated with the mass of the central component of the galaxy and of the bulge. And the scales are so different that that forces us to conclude that um, whatever form the galaxy had to form the black hole and that there's some feedback mechanism at play between the supermassive black hole and the, the center of the host galaxy. Well, I hope we can get back to that. So the idea that this thing, this hulking monster that uh, is at the center of the Milky Way and presumably over uh, in the centers of so many galaxies is doing more than just sitting there. It's doing something that affects the rest of the galaxy. I'd like to get back to that. But first, let's talk a little bit about, you know, when do you say, well, this, this, this is a super massive black hole. That doesn't mean it's super big. I mean, it's hard to decide how to measure the size of a, a black hole, you can't see it to begin with, but even aside from that, if it, you know, you have all this mass and it shrinks down, shrinks down, shrinks down to an infinitely small size, does it make any sense to ask how big this black hole at the center of the galaxy is? Well, certainly in terms of describing black holes, there are, there, black holes are, are, are actually fascinating objects because while they're really complicated in terms of physics, they're characteristically very simple. There's only three characteristics you can describe, the mass, the charge, or the spin, and that's it. So we can't talk about a, a, a scale, like a physical linear volume scale, because black holes have the attribute of having mass within zero volume, which of course uh, says uh, density is infinity, which in physics is a singularity, which really means you don't have your description of physics quite right there. Um, which is part of why there's such interesting objects to study. They're really, they point to the frontier of our knowledge of, of the physical world. Yeah, I think, I think uh, some people may be unaware that Stephen Hawking spent an awful lot of his time thinking about what goes on inside a black hole. But, but if, I, if I were near to this black hole, if I went to the center of the galaxy, I mean, that'd be a long trip and all. And, you know, I'm not sure that the food on route would make it worth it. But if I were to go there, what would I see? Would I see anything? You have a few more problems than that. <laughs> so, um, oh, well, the center, of the, well, I guess, it, uh, let's see. There's so many things that one can say about um, the environment around a black hole, um, just in general. And then, of course, at the center of our own galaxy. Um, as you approach... Um, the black hole, there is actually an abstract size that's really important in our discussion of black holes, known as the Schwarzschild radius or the event horizon. And what's so interesting about this is it's it's not a it's not a it's not a it's not a physical boundary, <laughs> but it is an important distance from the black hole because it's the last point at which light can escape from the black hole. So it means if you're on one side, effectively you can't see the other if you cross you can't and you can cross this boundary so you on your journey your bad food journey <laughs> um would happily cross over this boundary actually the classic one is you go and your friend stays or maybe you send your friend <laughs> yeah well you you assume i have friends but yeah. go ahead all right so i go on this journey i get to this right. yeah. of radius and yeah, and as you get closer, there's going to be all sorts of things that are going to happen. The one of the classic things to talk about in terms of how you and your friend may not perceive life that are what's happening in the same way, according to you, you're going to approach this, and because it's a gravitating mass, you're going to accelerate towards the center, and you're going to happily cross over that boundary but you won't be able to communicate back. All right, so I, friend, I, I, I can't see the friend anymore. You can't see the friend anymore, but your friend is gonna see you actually, instead of accelerating, get slower and slower and slower, and then just stall at the event horizon. And that's not because you're stalling, because you went right in. It's the fact that light, the light, which is really the messenger, like the carrier of information, the message that you send your friend, however you guys are communicating, 
is having a harder and harder time escaping the gravitational pull of the black hole. So your, your friend thinks you've stopped. So that's one of the, just the, just, you know, quite a few interesting paradoxes. The other thing that is often um, uh, fascinating uh, to talk about, about black holes is that the other th problem that you're gonna suffer, let's assume that you fall feet first. The gravitational pull on your feet is gonna be so much stronger than the gravitational pull on your head that you're actually gonna be torn apart. So, you know, forget the bad food. This is going to be the biggest problem you're going to face. Yeah, you're get not the, going to survive. It's, it's, it's called spaghettification, I believe, right? Yes, that's but, well, yes, you get tidally pulled apart, and we like to call it spaghettified because, of course, that really describes it very visually. Well, see, it's um, not all bad food. I mean, yeah, well, I, yes, we all, I like spaghetti. <laughs> okay, I, I want to ask you a little bit more about the, the, these big black holes. But uh, Rebecca has put up here some of the places that are tuned in. Uh, to to your presentations here, Norway, Argentina, Berlin, Glasgow, Antwerp, Louisiana, Australia, Europe. Where's Europe? Okay, Philippines, Portugal, Stockholm. Well, see, they, they maybe something they want want to give you a, another prize. Vancouver, Missouri, Burbank, Kentucky, and Romania. Burbank, not too far from where you are. All right, uh, just very briefly. I know that this this question can be asked briefly, but I'm not sure it can be answered briefly. But I, I've, I've heard it said that if you were to fall into that black hole, and let's say it's the one at the center of our galaxy, so it's got a lot of mass in there, it's not, you know, just a dead start. If you fall in and you go in at an angle, you know, maybe you survive spaghettification, you know, you, you remain a meatball or whatever, and you might actually travel uh, to a different part of the universe or, you know, to a different time or something like that, that this might be the ultimate time tunnel or something like that? Any truth to that or does no one know? Well, okay, so we're gonna assume that you're in some sort of incredible spaceship that can withstand the tidal forces of gravity. So we're already in the realm of science fiction. <laughs> um, so in, people do talk about the concept of black holes being ways of connecting the universe in, of a multi-dimensional universe so the notion that there are black holes that tie to white holes um, where you might exit in a different part of the universe but this can't be tested it's a it's an interesting notion but a, a, and, a, and an interesting framework for talking about the universe but you are definitely um, beyond the reach of, of, of uh, scientific tests. <laughs> All right, but I saw it in Interstellar in the movie, it must be real. It's a, and that was a fantastic movie for depicting um, all sorts of scientific concepts associated with black holes. I loved that movie. Well, it went on forever. I called it not Interstellar, I called it Interminable because I thought it was. <laughs> okay, we can talk about that later, <laughs> Andrea. But. Let's let's get to what you did here because we've been talking about these big black holes, and your prize was awarded because you really presented the unequivocal proof that that massive black hole in the center of our galaxy and in other galaxies must exist. What was the proof? I mean, obviously you didn't go there either. No, and the most direct proof that we can we can provide um, is to show that there's a lot of mass inside a small volume. And uh, so the way we did this was by um, developing techniques for large telescopes so that you can see stars at the heart of the galaxy. So the key is you want to see stars that are as close to the center of the galaxy as possible and to be able to track their motions, to measure their motions. So stars orbit um, the center of the galaxy for the same reason that planets orbit the sun, the gravitational influence of whatever's inside um, it, the star's orbit uh, makes it go around. And the, the size of the orbit and the duration of the orbital motion um, tells you how much mass is inside its orbit. So we have discovered stars that are so close that we can show that there are 4 million times the mass of the sun worth of mass at the center inside a scale that corresponds to the size of our solar system. And that has increased the evidence for a supermassive black hole by a factor of 10 million. So we've really moved it from a possibility to a certainty. Now, I, I have seen, and I think that the people who are watching you here, Andrea, 
can find on the web uh, these little movies you've made showing you know the stars orbiting there in the center of our galaxy something but you don't see the something it's just a blank bit of space there that's presumably where the black hole is right yeah and i think the fascinating little films uh and it, it, it's not trivial to make that right i mean if if you take the hubble space telescope and you aim it at the center of our galaxy you you don't see anything right i mean there's a reason you don't see anything with a hubble space telescope the view is kind of blocked well, let me see if I understand your question. So what we want to do is we want to be able, I mean, the, the first thing is that you want to be able to see stars. Um, so um, one of the first challenges is that um, starlight as you know, in the, historically has been studied at optical wavelengths, what your eye detects. And most um, optical light is blocked. Um, uh, it, uh, at least the optical light from the center of the galaxy to us because there's so much dust in the plane of our galaxy. So we have to go to the infrared. So you have to work at infrared wavelengths because rather than one out of every 10 billion photons or light packets um, being uh, making it to us, one out of every 10. So you can actually see the center of the galaxy at infrared wavelengths. The analogy I like to make for infrared, it's like where your TV remote control works. Um, and the next thing is that you need to overcome the blurring effects of the Earth's atmosphere to be able to see stars that are close enough to the center that the, um, you'll actually see them orbit on a reasonable time scale and such that you can actually um, confine the mass to a small enough volume that you've, you've made progress. Um, and the challenge there is the turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. So we have really big telescopes on Earth, which is great, much bigger than Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble can take an infrared picture, but the diameter of the mirror is 2.4 meters. And Keck, which is what, where I did the work, uh, my work, um, so out in Hawaii, it's 10 meters. So the advantage for this kind of work goes as the diameter to the fourth power. So you've got more than roughly a factor of 100 times improvement from going from Hubble to Keck. Okay, so Keck, that's why you want to use Keck. Um, so Keck allows you to get these the sharpest images ever obtained from this uh, of the center of the galaxy, all these stars. Um, and the, you know, it. I mean, it, it's such it's such an interesting question because, in fact, people didn't think we could do this in the beginning. Our first proposal got turned down because they didn't think our technology for compensating for the blurring effects of the Earth's atmosphere would work. And and what we did then was really primitive, actually, compared to what we do to do now. And in fact, we were only thinking that we would do this for three years and not 25 years. So we were only thinking about the very earliest or primitive approach. And even then people didn't really think it would work. Um, so what were, why was there such skepticism to something, to something that seems so obvious now? I mean, it's worked out, it, it's actually worked out far better than our wildest imagination. Um, we're doing things that are far more advanced than what that when, than what we originally proposed, and yeah. I think it's the technology. The technology um, wasn't proven, and um, lining up images to this precision is actually non-trivial. Um, it seems like such a simple thing. Take a movie, but everything in your frame is moving. Well, I, I just made a very rough calculation before we started this little conversation. I'm sure it's wrong, but. You know, it was like being given the, the task of sort of watching, making a movie of the motion of ants on a dime from a football field away, right? It's, 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 it's not easy. You, you can work out the numbers. Ants just, on a dime, a football field away. Okay, now that's a nice analogy. <laughs> well, you, you should check it. And, okay, and, and, I am going to do that. That's all right. And check it, check it with the ants, too, because. Okay, it, yeah. <laughs> But, but, but the fact that you had difficulty, you know, convincing the funders to go with this, that sounds very much like the problem that uh, uh, Bill Barucki, who's over at NASA Ames Research Center here, not far from where the SETI Institute is, the same problem he had getting money to build the Kepler Space Telescope. That was rejected and rejected and, re and rejected. And yet, you know, that's one of the big triumphs of astronomy now. So you're in good company as far as that goes. I think that's often the story with people who um, do something new and different, um, convincing people to, to, to look and try something that's slightly risky um, yeah. is not the way people want to go. And I think, you know, I, I like to tell my students that the most important thing is to, you know, is to find something you care about 
you know, that's, that's what's going to give you the drive to, to actually get it done. Let's return to a question that came up a little bit earlier, and that is, okay, so you've actually seen the stars zipping around this massive black hole in the center of the galaxy. The, the black hole is surely there. It's a heavy duty beast, but we're 20, what, 28,000 light years away or something like that from this thing. So how does that affect me, the car buyer? Does it have any effect on me? Obviously it has effect on you, but you know, does that black hole have any influence on you know, the fact that our solar system is here, that we're here, that kind of thing? Oh, well, there are a lot of ways to approach this question. Um, so let's approach, let's take one angle and look at, um, we care because the black hole probably had immense influence on the formation and evolution of the galaxy. So if you say we're here, <laughs> the galaxy formed. Um, so in the very largest scale of things, there there's a clear connection there. If you wanna take the more um, 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 sociological perspective of why do we care? <laughs> So we discovered a black hole. So what? <laughs> As my teenagers might say, <laughs> um, it's. I think it's a. It's a. It's part of why we as humans do basic research. We're curious, and basic research is what ultimately leads to things that really do have huge impact on us. But we can't predict. I mean, that's almost the, the by definition the the um, what basic research is. You don't go at it because there's an application. You go at it because there's a fundamental understanding um, that's that's um, that you want to advance to describe how um, the universe works. I mean, there's a wonderful study by I think it was the National Science Foundation that looked at the physics that's necessary uh, for our cell phones to work. And if you look at the historical development of so many different aspects, most of them were discovered or pursued in light of why would in the world would you care <laughs> when, when these notions were being discovered. So I think, you know, we can't understand, you know, I don't think we can understand today. Um, um, how our understanding or any improvements in our understanding of gravity might, might, but might work. If we look just one step back, we couldn't use um, these wonderful app, apps to understand how to get from point A to point B, Google, like whatever your fav favorite app, Google or Waze is, without um, our cell phones programming in general relativity. Um, so here we think this is a rather abstract, um, esoteric field, and yet we're actually using it on a daily on a daily basis. The win for basic research. Well, there are a bunch of questions here, Andrea, yeah. and uh, right. I, I'd like to read a couple of these. But before we do that, I have to ask you the obligatory question asked of everyone who has won a Nobel Prize, uh, and that is, you know, where were you when the phone call came, and you know, what was that like? Well, I'm in California, so I I was at home and I was fast asleep. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's a, it's an, it's an amazing moment. I was actually quite surprised because my home phone rang and I, somehow they had my home phone number. Nobody has my home phone number. <laughs> um, you know, it's usually the, the, you know, the endless, uh, Robocalls. Um, Robocalls, yes. But that doesn't happen at 2 a.m. So at 2 a.m., you know, your your immediate instinct or mine was to think, oh, somebody's sick. Um, so, you know, you get up sort of startled and worried, and then you very quickly realize, oh, <laughs> this is a very, this is not, this is a very different phone call. Um, so it was thrilled. I mean, I was just thrilled, half asleep, but thrilled. <laughs> Did you, were you able to sleep the rest of the night? Maybe not. Oh, gosh, no. I mean, I was invited to take part in a press conference at 3 a.m. Uh, so I uh, you know, quickly made a pot of coffee. I'm an astronomer. I'm used to being up in the middle of the night. I kind of know how to do this. <laughs> Have a sleep is my gig. <laughs> and that, that would make a great bumper sticker. Let's go to some of these questions here. Um, all right. How many black holes are there? Simple question. I suppose, you know, you can have an error bar that's greater than one or two, but I mean, are black holes very common or are they very rare? 
Well, I guess it depends on what kind of black holes. So let's talk about the supermassive black holes, uh, which are the ones we're really focused on here. Um, we think that um, most, if not all galaxies form with one supermassive black hole at their centers. Um, and it is true that galaxies evolve by merging uh, with one another. In fact, the Milky Way is on its way to a collision with Andromeda. Nothing to worry about. It's very long term. But you know, these two galaxies have supermassive black holes at their centers. And what will happen when two galaxies um, uh, merge that have two, well, each one has a supermassive black hole, they'll form a new galaxy. So the stars will sort themselves out into another galaxy. And the two most massive objects are gonna sink to the center of the new galaxy and will ultimately spiral in and merge to make a more massive uh, supermassive black hole at the center of the new galaxy. So one per galaxy. One per galaxy. I think that the estimate for how many galaxies uh, our telescopes could, in principle, see is something like two trillion. That's a lot of black hole pleasure, if it's true. <laughs> that is indeed a lot of black hole <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> All right, let's see here. Um, yeah, do we need to understand quantum gravity to uh, understand black holes? Or is it going to work the other way around? Maybe, maybe it does work the other way around. It is, it is certainly, um, the thinking is that you need to figure out how to make gravity and quantum mechanics work together to understand what a black hole fundamentally is. Um, and presumably one may get you know, deeper insight into both um, general relativity or gravity and quantum mechanics. All right, here's, a, here's another one. Uh, what is it? Yes, do supermassive black holes evaporate at faster rates than smaller black holes. And, uh, and you might uh, explain what that means for a black hole to evaporate. Uh, okay, you know. so there's this notion of Hawking radiation. So that black holes radiate, which is an equivalent way of, of talking about mass loss. So for the supermassive black holes, this is negligible. This is, it just, uh, it's not gonna affect the evolution of these really, really massive things. And in fact, even for the stellar map, over the evolution of the of the age of the of the universe, even for the stellar mass black holes, this is a negligible thing. But if you want to talk about these possibly tiny, tiny black holes that might form, it, um, they're going to evaporate very quickly. So the smaller the black hole is, the more important the, the concept of Hawking radiation is. So it's like drops of water. The smaller ones evaporate more quickly. Right? Yes. Kind of like, I, I, I think uh, there was an estimate of how long it takes a supermassive black hole to evaporate I mean, via this Hawking radiation. It was like 10 to the 100 years, which is a long time to wait you know, for the bus. But 10 to the 100 years, uh, you know, that's one followed by 100 zeros for those who are not into scientific notation. But it, it's usually said that that's the last thing that will happen in our universe. It's not the end of the universe. It'll keep expanding. It's going to be really dark and uninteresting, and there won't be any good television. But the last thing that'll happen that anybody can think of is the last black hole goes away. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. I mean, there's a wonderful book by uh, Fred Adams um, called The Dark Ages, which takes the evolution of the universe to its absurd extremes. And you do end up with this very dark, bleak place of supermassive black holes that are slowly radiating away. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound like a lot of fun. Let's see if there's another thing here. I'll stick with the here and now. <laughs> uh, yeah, are all black holes, this is an interesting question. Uh, I'm not even sure I understand what it means, which probably adds to its interest. Are all black holes connected to every other black hole? I have no idea. <laughs> That's a good answer. All right. Uh, what, what emerging or future technologies can we employ to advance our understanding of how to view a black hole, in your opinion? Oh, gosh. You know, right now, it's so exciting um, in terms of our the technology that's being developed that's furthering our understanding of black holes, be they stellar mass black holes or the supermassive black holes. So um, the development of gravitational wave detectors, so LIGO and Virgo, um, which were recognized um, recently with, uh, with the Nobel Prize is 
is a, a really um, exciting way of studying stellar mass black holes. And then the space equivalent of this, um, LISA, um, will enable us to look at the supermassive black holes in, in a similar way. So we were just talking a moment ago about the possibility that our galaxy and, and Andromeda will merge and ultimately the supermassive black holes, those supermassive black holes will merge. LISA, the space-based mission, will be sensitive to the merger of supermassive black holes. So LIGO does stellar mass, LISA does supermassive. So I think that will be super exciting and that's underway. Um, there's been uh, tremendous excitement over the Event Horizon Telescope. So this um, is a radio telescope approach where you take telescopes from all over the world um, and you image um, the radio emission from the just outside the event horizon of these of these black holes. And um, the two cases that they focused on one one is M87, and that's the picture that has just gone around the world. Um, uh, has been the first one. And, and it's interesting because in fact, at the beginning of that project, I believe this, the galaxy was the one people were focused on. And it turns out that that's a, a much harder case than the M87. And the reason is M87 is a, a bigger black hole. So the event horizon is larger. So things that are going around the outside of the event horizon has a longer period. So the important thing here is that the time scales for change are longer than the rotation of the earth. So that means that the object looks static while this telescope that's being created by the earth's rotation. So you can get a picture. Our black hole is smaller. And so the periods are faster and the changes are shorter than the period of the Earth's rotation a day. And that makes the, the center of our galaxy much more challenging. So in other words, the imaging problem that they face is more complicated, although they, these guys are hard at work and I suspect we'll see something um, soon from them um, on, this, on, this, uh, on this front. Um, so those are just, two examples uh, among many, many others that are opening up our ability. And of course, okay. my favorite one, I have to talk about the 30 meter telescope, the next generation of really big telescopes <laughs> yeah. um, for studying these super, super massive black holes. Well, if they get it built. I, you know, it, it seems to me that, uh, okay, what you're saying is for, for people who are not into galaxies, M87 is, you know, it's number 87 in Messier's catalog, but it's, it's, it's a big galaxy out there. And it, it has this big black hole. But you're saying that because that black hole is so much bigger, you know, the stars moving around it take their, they're farther out, they take their time. And so that makes it easier to make a still photograph. Whereas the center of our galaxy, they're moving so fast that you can't, you know, sort of assemble the data from telescopes around the world over the period of a Earth's rotation and make a good you know, high resolution photos. Actually, let me be even more careful with what we're looking at because each of these technologies are sensitive to a different carrier of information, let's say. So we've talked about gravitational wave. So the, the work that I've done is at infrared wavelengths and um, the stars emit a lot at infrared wavelengths. So we're, it's a good wavelength to, to, to capture starlight. Gravitational waves is a totally different technique. You're looking at um, the mixing of space and time when things smash together. Um, the Event Horizon Telescope is looking at um, radio wavelengths. So it's re that's really um, sensitive to um, get accretion, uh, the energy emitted from an accretion disk around the, so it's gas. So it's gas, not stars. And gas that um, is really just sitting right at the edge of the Event Horizon. All right. Andrea, we're going to let you go here, but I'm going to ask one last uh, question, and and that is LIGO, which of course has been in the news quite a bit, the gravitational wave detector, um, often sees what are interpreted as colliding black holes. Now, uh, you know, that sounds pretty intriguing. If you would watch two black holes collide, and I guess if you wait two billion years, you might be able to see that in our own galaxy. Uh, what would it look like? What happens to those two black holes? Will it become a slightly bigger black hole? <laughs> um, and in fact, you know, if you'd asked me about five years ago, if I thought there was any connection between these stellar mass black hole mergers and what we see at the center of the galaxy, I would have said absolutely not. But in um, the re 
But uh, it's become clear to me that there may be an, a really important connection. We're seeing these really interesting stars at the center of the galaxy that are so big that um, as they approach the black hole, they get tidally pulled apart. So you actually see these tidal streams and then they go by and they become compact again. So that's fascinating, but they have to be super big. And so our interpretation of this is that they're binary stars, so two stars, that have been driven to merge by the black hole to make a bigger star. So they, it inflates, it becomes puffy and you see these disruptions. But the reason I think this is so interesting is it tells you the pairs of stars close to the black hole merge faster than we thought. Um, in other words, we weren't really thinking about the role of supermassive black holes and mergers of two stellar things. So one of the things, or two of the things that is interesting about LIGO is LIGO is finding um, black holes that are bigger than we thought. So they're 30 times the mass of the sun instead of 10. And they're happening more frequently than we thought. So I think that what we're seeing at the center of the galaxy might be lighting up an important process for understanding processes that give rise to the, um, the stellar black hole mergers that are being detected by LIGO. So I think this really um, highlights the, the beauty of having different experiments um, that have different windows on the universe. Um, just that each one gives you insight um, and they may connect in really unexpected ways. Well, Andrea, it's really been a pleasure talking to you. And uh, by the way, are you going to put that uh, Nobel Prize on the mantle? Do you even have a mantle? I do. <laughs> right back there. Oh yeah, right back there. Is 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 the prize on it, or have they? Or have you gotten it yet? yet. <laughs> well, you have to be sure to pass it around at parties. <laughs> <laughs> when we can have that party. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a point. Well, Andre, I guess it's been, as I say, a real pleasure talking to you. And I want to thank all of the people that have been watching. Uh, the SETI Institute is pleased to be able to bring these things to you. And by the way, the Institute is a nonprofit, so we do depend on your support. If you want to get the newsletter from the uh, SETI Institute, and those go out on a regular basis, all you have to do is go to SETI.org. That's the Institute's website and look around and you'll find uh, the mechanism required for you to get those newsletters there. And I also want to thank Rebecca McDonald, Lee Lee, and uh, well, I guess that's the crew today, in addition to Andrea for uh, today's SETI Live. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you in a, well, less than a week, I think. <laughs>